Hi everyone, so I'm going to be presenting you some work today which is about simulating kinetic equations uh, in high collisional regimes with a diffusive scaling. Uh, we're going to use a particle based method with multi-level Monte Carlo to do this. So this is work done in collaboration with my two supervisors Giovanni Somai and Stefan van der Walle, as well as in part with a fellow PhD student Bert Murtir at Keolo. So, um, with that, we're going to start off with some motivation. So, why are we looking at kinetic equations? Well, um, we have colleagues at the Department of Mechanical Engineering at our university who are working on components in tokamak fusion reactors. These fusion reactors are something, uh, they look something like this. Uh, so, they're toroidally shaped. They have a plasma moving around inside them at, uh, at high speed with lots of energy. And the goal is then to combine... Um, particles together to create energy in these reactors. Now these reactors are incredibly expensive to build when we want to do prototyping, so a better approach is to take numerical simulation and to test designs before we try them in the real world. Uh, and that's where then we come in as numerical uh, mathematicians or computer scientists. And we're going to be then looking at the simulation of neutral particles which are injected into this plasma as a way of controlling it. Uh, neutral particles are not influenced by the electromagnetic fields used to control the plasma. So that's why we use neutral particles for this purpose. And uh, modeling these particles is a difficult problem for two reasons. So first off, there are multiple timescales in the problem. So we have the fact that the particles collide with very high frequency with the background medium. But we want to look at longer time horizons to estimate things like how the density or the flux of particles changes through time. And this is going to happen at much longer time horizons, meaning we need very many time steps to perform our simulations. Then we also have an issue of dimensionality. So um, each particle, uh, at each moment in time, we have to know where it is, but we also have to know where it's going. So we have to model position and velocity, meaning that if we have a three-dimensional realistic simulation, we have to model three dimensions in space, three dimensions in velocity, as well as then a time dependency giving us a 7D model. And this is why we use uh, Monte Carlo techniques for our simulations. Now at the mathematical level, what we can do is uh, say that at each moment in time, a particle is defined by its position x and its velocity v. The distribution of particles in, in position, velocity, and time, we call f, and it's modeled by a kinetic equation, which looks like this in our case. Uh, what does this equation say? Well, particles, uh, they move, they change, they, their distribution changes in time. They move through space uh, with a transport term according to the velocity the particles have. And on the right hand side, we have a collision operator. And what does this do? Well, it removes particles from the uh, distribution proportional to the number of particles that have that position and that velocity and then we'll reintroduce the particles at the same position um, but using a steady state velocity distribution m uh, with rho here being the particle density now what we want to do now is drive the collision rate up uh, so we get close to the limit of infinite collisions and to do this, we're going to introduce a parameter epsilon and divide the right-hand side by epsilon. So as epsilon goes to zero, the collision rate goes to infinity. And at the same time, we're also going to rescale time. And this is called the diffusive scaling. We have the same epsilon both here and here. Why that is called that, uh, we will come to in a moment. But intuitively, you can understand it in the following way. So what's happening is you have a particle which at almost an infinite rate is having collisions and it's just going to keep changing direction. So it's not going to go anywhere. And if you want to do things like look at the, what the net drift effects are of the sum of all these collisions, then you're going to have to look at almost an infinite time horizon to figure out these dynamics. And to avoid that, what we're going to do is also just shrink the time axis back so we can look at finite time um, in our simulations again. So that's why this epsilon pops up here. Now I'm going to divide out epsilon from the whole thing and this is then going to give us 
our model equation for the remainder of this talk. So this is a diffusively scaled kinetic equation modeling the distribution F. At the level of particles, the model is quite simple. So particles move in a straight line uh, for an exponentially distributed amount of time with the expected time between collisions being epsilon squared, the same one that we have up here. And at the end of this period, uh, we have a collision, so we have to draw a new velocity. And we do this by sampling a velocity from the distribution m. And then we send the particle on its way again um, until the next moment with a collision. Now we have these two descriptions, particles and the distribution of particles. And in both cases, when we drive epsilon to zero, we get convergence to uh, a nice analytical limiting equation. So at the PDE level, we have, uh, in terms of the density, convergence to the heat equation, which is what you see here. And that's where the name diffusive scaling also comes from. And at the particle level, all these collisions, when we add them up and shrink the collision time, the time between collisions to zero, add up to Brownian motion. So that's what you see here with normally distributed increments psi. Now, if we want to simulate this, uh, we can take a simple scheme in this case. What we're going to do is take fixed time steps delta t and apply, apply an operator splitting. Uh, what does that mean? Well, first we're going to look at just the transport effects, giving us this equation right here. And we model that at the particle level by saying, well, that particle has a position and it has a velocity, so we can just do a forward time step to get a new position at the end of the time step. Uh, at the end of this um, transport step, we have to look at the collisions. So then we have this part of the equation. And we model collisions in a fairly straightforward way. So what we do is we compute the probability of there having been a collision or not having been a collision, given the time step delta t. And if we decide there was a collision, then based on this probability, we resample the velocity from the distribution m. If we decide there was no collision, we just keep it as it was before. So the scheme itself is quite simple, but there's one big issue in taking this simple approach. And it pops up here as this 1 over epsilon we have here. Now what's going to happen as we get closer and closer to this limit of infinite collisions per unit time is that this term is going to blow up. So we're going to have to take small time steps to keep everything finite. And this is how this, this multiple time scale problem manifests itself then in this numerical scheme. Now, the rest of this talk is going to be about how we use a number of techniques to present a new scheme that will avoid uh, these issues. So first off, I'm going to introduce asymptotic preserving particle schemes, or one specific asymptotic preserving particle scheme, which is going to allow us to take large time steps in a stable way, but this is going to come at the cost of introducing a bias in the computed result. Next, I'm going to use multi-level Monte Carlo to use the fact that we can take large time steps in a biased way and small time steps to compute the correct result to combine multiple levels of discretization to compute an accurate result at reduced cost. Then I'm going to give some technical details on how we do this in practice because we need to have correlated particle simulations to do multi-level Monte Carlo and finally present some results uh, that we have recently found. So with that, the asymptotic preserving particle scheme the goal is as follows. We're going to re replace our original kinetic equation right here with an alternative scheme proposed in this paper here. And what's going on here? Well, you see that instead of three terms, we now have four. Uh, so what's new? We have an explicit diffusive term, which has popped up, which is what we expect to converge to in this limit of epsilon going to zero. And we also see that the uh, fractions here, uh, the coefficients of the scheme, explicitly contain the time step delta t. Uh, so what's actually going on? Well, you can consider this new equation as a weighted sum of, on the one hand, our original kinetic equation, 
and on the other hand, the heat equation the, that we want to converge to in the limit of epsilon going to zero. And how can you see that? Well, if you take the two limits of delta t, on the one hand taking delta t to zero, so very small time steps, we see that uh, this term here becomes v over epsilon, the same thing we have up here. This term here disappears, so this fraction becomes zero. And this one here becomes one over epsilon squared. So if we take very small time steps, we have no issue simulating the original model. So we also just la la let the scheme converge back to the original model and we simulate exactly what we want to simulate, i.e. this equation. If we take the other limit, so delta t going to infinity, what happens? Well, this term disappears. This becomes one. And then this disappears. So then we have the heat equation, which has no time step restrictions. We can simulate it ar with arbitrarily large time steps and have no issues. But the heat equation is not going to give us the exact results we want. So this is exactly what's going on. It's a kind of gradual transition from one equation, which is stable, to uh, an equation that requires fine time steps, but we only use that when we actually simulate with fine time steps. So that's our key result that we're going to use here. We can simulate it much as before. So we take an operator splitting approach. We first ignore the collision operator. And then we have a particle position x, a velocity v, and now also some Brownian motion, which we add in here. And we do then a forward time step. And this Brownian motion then comes from the fact that we have a diffusion operator right here. And a key thing to now note is that where we had this 1 over epsilon before, which was blowing up, we now have a fraction which remains finite for all values of, of epsilon. So this is exactly what we wanted to achieve using this asymptotic preserving scheme. So that's good. The collisions are basically as before. The, the, the fractions now are slightly different values compared to what I showed in the previous slide, but we just do the same thing. So we take, we compute the probability of there having been a collision in the given time step, and then based on that probability, we either decide to do a collision or not, and then resample the velocity. So that works very nicely, and now we're going to then use this, together with multi-level Monte Carlo, to gradually correct this inaccurate simulation with the heat equation down to the correct kinetic model that we want. Okay, so just a quick recap of multi-level Monte Carlo, uh, also just fixing notation for what we're doing, we have a quantity of interest y. And let's say in this case, it's at the expected value of some function of the particle position at time t star. Now, uh, a single level Monte Carlo estimator over a particle uh, ensemble would then just simulate p particles until time t star, apply the function to each one, and then average over the results. This makes an error, of course. So on the one hand, we have a bias. The smaller the time step, the smaller the bias, but the more expensive each trajectory is, so we can't do as many trajectories. We also have a variance, and that depends on the number of trajectories we simulate. So the more trajectories, the smaller the variance, and then we have to make some kind of trade-off, right? So if we have a given computational budget, we have to decide how many trajectories can we simulate, and we can do more trajectories if we take fewer time steps, so larger time steps in each one. And then we have to make a, a trade-off between bias on the one hand and variance on the other hand. And the idea behind multi-level Monte Carlo is this trade-off doesn't have to be made so explicitly. What you can instead do is simulate with multiple different time steps. So you start off with a very coarse simulation with very large time step delta t0. Because it's a large time step, we can do very many samples, simulate many particles, and we then compute something which has a large bias, but the bias is always going to be the same. So it's a repeatable simulation, and it's predictable. That means there's some value which we can subtract from what we compute with this course estimator to give us the actual result we want to compute. And then the next step is then going to be how we estimate this bias somehow. And we do this in the following way. So we have, uh, on the one hand, a simulation with a coarse time step. On the other hand, a simulation with a finer time step. And the idea then is to simulate the same qualitative path 
with two different discretizations uh, and then compare the results of the two. And if the paths are basically the same, then the difference of the results should be due to the discretization. Assuming that the fine simulation is more accurate than the coarse simulation, we can say that the, what we have here, this difference is going to be a good estimate of the bias of the coarse simulation. And then we can then try to estimate the remaining bias by adding more of these levels. So we then do that, we sum over the results, and this gives us a multi-level Monte Carlo estimator. Okay, so somehow we have to simulate the same path with two different discretizations. And uh, the way we go about that is as follows. So let's say we want to span some time interval delta t l minus 1, which is going to be our coarse time interval. We can do that on the one hand with a single coarse time step. Or we can do the same thing by taking m, capital M, finer time steps delta t l. So m times delta t l equals delta t l minus 1. So that's what we have here. Now, if we want to have these two processes over the same time interval follow the same path, we can go to work as follows. First, we do our m fine time steps. And in each time step, we generate random velocities v and random size as we go along. And um, then we just save these m sets of random numbers as we compute. After we've done that, we can then combine these m sets of random numbers into a single set of random numbers for our course simulation. So we're going to generate one v and one xi for the course simulation. And if we do this in a clever way, then the paths will be matching each other uh, and, as we would say, correlated. OK, so one more important thing before we move on. Uh, we have to remember that these coefficients here depend on the time steps we use to simulate with. OK, so if we have a very small time step delta TL and a very coarse time step delta TL minus 1, then what's going to happen is this is going to be much larger than this, and this is going to be much larger than this. So if in our fine simulation we have a whole bunch of these v's and they have quite a bit of influence in the fine simulation, we also want them to have lots of influence in the coarse simulation. So in fact what we're going to do is when we generate this coarse xi, we're going to not only use the m fine size, but also use information from these v's. And so we're going to combine this and this to generate this. And then we're also going to use some information from the velocities to make sure the course velocities are also consistent. Uh, so first off, generating this course xi. So we're going to generate it as a weighted sum of, on the one hand, something coming from fine diffusion, and then something coming from fine velocities. Uh, and we're going to weight them in this way. And if you do that, assuming that this has mean 0 and variance 1, and this also has mean 0 and variance 1, then the same will hold here, so mean 0 and variance 1. So that's what we have going on here. So we have, on the one hand, a rescaled sum of fine size, which is just a normally distributed number. The sum of Gaussians is also Gaussian. And then we have the sum of velocities, which we also have to rescale. And if these velocities are normally distributed, which is a choice of model, then everything is well. So then this is also all normally distributed. If that's not the case, well, then we have some other stuff coming up. But what we can guarantee is if this has mean 0 and variance 1, then this will also have mean 0 and variance 1, and we will have a so-called weak Brownian motion. So this does present us with some caveats. So we have to remember uh, we have this multi-level telescope in some which we want to be consistent. That means, let's say, we have a very coarse simulation uh, at level 0. And we're also going to be performing time steps, uh, course time steps at level one, with the same course uh, time step size as we had at level zero, and we want these two to simulate the same model. So, if we have this weak diffusive process at uh, in the course simulation at level one, we're also going to have to adapt uh, the level zero course simulation. If so that applies in the case of non-Gaussian velocities. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, 
But if you want to know more, uh, there should be something coming on Archive soon with lots of detail. You can also just uh, ask questions or get in touch uh, after the video. So that's the Gaussians. Now we also have these velocities that we want to correlate, I mentioned. Now, first off, we have to decide if there is a collision in the course simulation. And the way we'd go about doing that is we look at, was there at least one collision in the final simulation? And there's at least one collision in the final simulation if, let's say, at each fine time step, we draw a random U and compare it to some threshold to see if there's a collision. Well, we just look at the largest of these U's. If the largest U was large enough to generate a collision, then there was a fine collision. And uh, we're going to use this largest U then in the course simulation um, with some small changes to maintain uh, the statistics of the course simulation. So we're going to take the mth power instead of just the variable U. And that is then going to be compared against the threshold in the course simulation to find out if there was a collision or not in the course simulation. And if there is a collision in the course simulation, we then take the last velocity in the final simulation to use as a velocity going into the next time step of the course simulation so the two match up again as we go on. Okay, now I'm just going to very quickly present um, a result on this. So first off, we have a number of different uh, parameters in our model. We have our, our fine time scale, the, collision, the time between collisions, epsilon squared. We have a sequence of time steps we have to choose uh, for our levels. We have to choose a sequence of weights uh, between 0 and 1 for this, this com combination of fine diffusion and fine velocities for coarse diffusion. And the overall goal is going to be how do we bridge coarse time steps uh, or coarse time scales with time steps that are then the order of magnitude of the collision rate. And the way that we've found to do this is we start with a very coarse simulation, delta t0, which is very large. And then in level one, we're going to go from this very coarse simulation down to a point where we can resolve our fine simulation, uh, or our fine collisions. So we're going to take a very large jump in level one. And that's actually going to resolve our time scale separation right there. Now, if we want further refinement, what we can do is take a geometric sequence of levels going down. Uh, that's going to be necessary if the tolerance is set to be very accurate. And uh, that's basically our level strategy. In terms of the weights, we've pretty much found out that uh, we don't gain so very much by taking this combined approach where we take both velocities and diffusion in our, from our fine simulations to generate coarse diffusion once we get into this geometric regime. So we're just going to set this weight to 1 using only fine diffusion for coarse diffusion. And we're going to take this combined approach where we take both of them and to generate the coarse diffusion in level 1. So then we're going to have a weight smaller than 1. Okay. Uh, for an actual result, we have here uh, with a Gaussian velocity distribution, what we're going to do is estimate the squared particle displacement. And what we have is the level number, the time step uh, used at the fine simulation of the level, the result, so that the term in the telescopic sum that's computed at that level, the variance of samples at the level, the number of samples we have to take, and then the overall cost of the level. And then this is the overall simulation cost and what we actually compute. And I just want you to look at one row, which is this row right here. And what you see is that the variance of level one, where we make this huge jump from diffusive simulations to kinetic simulations, has a much smaller variance than level zero, which means that our correlation strategy works very well. And all of these fine simulations require very many or much less samples than the course simulation. Again, showing why we want to use multi-level Monte Carlo in this case. And then if we look at the overall cost of the simulation, we see that the multi-level simulation requires almost 10 to the ninth uh, cost, given our cost metric, while a single level uh, would have to take this number of samples at this discretization, giving us a cost uh, order 10 to the 12th. So we have a speed up of a, roughly a factor of 1,000 in this case. 
So with that, there's going to be an archive uh, article appearing soon with a lot more technical details, uh, stuff I've skipped over today. And we hope to also soon present some more uh, real world simulation results, uh, which are more applicable to the fusion case I talked about in the beginning in the near future. Most of this work is based on these three papers here, uh, with these two being background material. And with that, I welcome any questions.